free and clear, they're using it. Security companies, the moment they can't access it or there's an interference, that's when they have the problem. That's how we are. I consider what we do to be an essential service because we also provide that um, efficient, free and clear access for marine, that is all those ships that are traveling, all those yachts, um, the planes, all plane, helicopters, any other aeronautical communication. Um, if you're doing wireless streaming, so if you decided that you wanted to beam this to some other location, remote location, you need a VSAT link, and we have to deal with that as well. Um, as I said, one of the most important things that we also do is to provide quality advice to the government of Jamaica as it relates to the radio frequency spectrum, allocation of it, use of it, how to market it, um, policies that deal with users, investors, operators, mm -hmm. as well as how we relate to the international bodies, whether regionally or locally, in relation to the spectrum. What we are mostly known for, though, <laughs> is the licensing and certification. Because as it is now, the act dictates that nobody should be using the spectrum that is without a license. Now, this is typically speaking to devices that can communicate or transmit outside of a one mile radius. Usually the items that are within a one mile radius once there's a type approval, meaning it has been approved by us that it doesn't do anything outside of what it ought to be done to do, you are free to use it. Um, however, what tends to happen if a manufacturer of a particular equipment does not get it approved prior to you taking it here, when it reaches customs, they are supposed to detain it and then you, take, you get a notice of detention to take to us and then we have to validate or certify that that equipment is okay to enter and operate and it is not going to do anything contrary to what it is being deemed to do. The other types we have are licensed for private radio stations. Um, citizen band amateur radio operators also have to get a permit or license to operate cb operators the same thing i call a cb radio we're ta say c taxi men yes um there are people who just do it for an hobby where they put up the what the, the big antennas and speak to people in cuba miami puerto rico jamaica um, truckers, right. They are also marine, mobile, and aeronautical that I was speaking about. That's just a fancy word for the ships, ship radios talking to each other, or the planes talking to the tower, and the tower talking to the plane. Type approvals, and I spoke to that already, for the equipment. So you can either get it yourself, but usually what happens is the type approval is done by the manufacturers. Because if a manufacturer is going to market in this region, he finds somebody who is a broker that says, okay, you need to get these permits to sell in these countries, and then they arrange it for them. The you can check with us, and my recollection is we actually do it free. So you check and say, is this approved? And we say yes. And you Go to the email, send a specific specifications, and you'll get a response. Outside of that, we charge. No, man. The response, usually within 24 hours at most, if not before. Because it goes to a general email, and then that is sent to anybody, or three or four of us. And then there are technicians now who work on antennas, towers, are supposed to be certified by us as well, to say that they can. I don't want to tell you what usually I'm in the industry, and I shouldn't. But the technicians who claim to be who they are, shh, if you're using a technician, if you're a radio station and using a technician to work on your tower and your antennas, 
to deal with the radio frequency spectrum, they should be approved by the Spectrum Management Authority. Um, band planning and frequency assignment, that's just the pretty name for allocating slots and ranges because the frequency goes all the way from down here to all the way up there. So there are different lanes of frequencies and then there are different, we would call them columns of frequencies. That's, so that's really what band planning and frequency assignment does. They decide which one is going to be used for what. So they say, okay, this lane and this column or this cell, if you're using it, layman term, you know, similar to an Excel cell, this cell will be used for domestic mobile or this cell will be used for radio stations and they all act you now depending on who you are and what power range or equipment have where you operate and give you call signs if it's something that is relevant to you. Um, monitoring inspection and interference management that's a function where we monitor now if you people are using it, licensees are using it according to how they <laughs> are supposed to. If persons are using it without a license, and some people will have interference from time to time, we have to be able to identify the interference and locate it and also mitigate against it. And sometimes interference happens for a variety of reasons. We might have to reassign or reallocate accordingly. Um, what I did is put some pictures of equipment that interfere with, if you want to say, or use the radio frequency spectrum. That's the CB amateur radar that we're talking about. The VSAT is yeah, big money work, but it's really, its job is to send a signal to a satellite or connect to high-speed broadband from remote areas. Right. Industrial equipment, as simple as we say, they, if they start making noise, all the noise operate on a frequency. I'm sure, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that. You should be if you work in this industry. So some industrial equipment will give off interference in certain frequency. You have to leave it free and clear for them, depending, or make some adjustment for them. Medical and scientific equipment, citizen band radio, same. And then there's a private radio, like the walkie-talkie, and those used by security companies. There are other things, these are just... I didn't put one of the most important ones there. I'm wondering if people are going to guess what it is. The audience, that is. <laughs> no. <laughs> Close. Monitoring vehicle, these are some of the equipment that we use for the management now. The one to my extreme right is the old type spectrum radar receiver. Old because, you see how big it is? The newer ones are really smaller. What it can do is it collects all the spectrum and then you can tell it to or use it to take out each signal then pinpoint each signal or find which one out of the 20 signals that are there and then you operate accordingly this is the under spectrum analyzer in the middle you actually walk with it into areas that you might not be able to send the vehicle which is the monitoring vehicle or yeah that is it Oh, yeah, that is it. It does not speak about anything else about it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> we take that to areas where you want, where you don't have a tower, or where you want to quickly triangulate and find the interference or monitor. Um, this is a copy of a chart which is used for radio frequency, spectrum alloc allocation chart, which is used by the band planning and frequency assignment group. Those pretty, pretty colors, each color denotes a different frequency, well, each frequency and band. So what is shown there is those dif whatever categories of industry, investor, type, work. So you give different colors to different categories. If I'm saying it correctly, I think I should am. So that's really what it looks like in a lay layman's term. So we have to manage all of those and the different persons and bodies that operate within all of those. As it relates to film, animation, and music, most of your licenses are short term, more or less, when you're dealing with the, your industry. 
and it's either certification for your equipment or a short term license to operate your equipment. Um, the most of the equipment is either two way walkie talkie, drones, or most in few instances, the VSATs. Um, the drones are going to speak to the drones. The drones is basically why we are interested in the drones, that is spectrum management, is because it's a wireless device. So we're only interested in the frequency that you use to communicate with the drone. So from that point of view, um, customers may look at it and say, oh, if this, this device has not been approved by the manufacturer, then they may hold on to it and ask it to get a, a certification. Yeah, um, for the stream, welcome guys, welcome. Um, part of my question is, that based on this, the 2.4 gigahertz and the 5.8 are, are public bands, basically. Why would Spectrum um, be so aligned to want it to restrict it when a lot of the drone manufacturers mm -hmm. are already uh, placing their units in that Spectrum alignment band and also you know, because it creates a, its, its own charge. I understand the risk of um, Wi-Fi dropout or connectivity issues, but if it's already in a public band, why the, why the concern? Well, <laughs> as good as the question is, the concern for us at the time was there was no dedicated, um, what do you call it, band, if you, you understand what I'm saying, because there were hosts of them, they were just coming in. There was no way that we could validate that a drone that is coming in is not outside of those bands that you're saying. So that, with that in mind, we asked customs to refer to it. And I think customs was operating off their own technical thing where they are trying to say anything that is wireless, just refer it to pe Spectrum if we can't if we don't have a standard. So shouldn't you consider almost then if the basic drone, almost every drone is running off a 2.4 or 5, mm -hmm. um, shouldn't it almost be that you can remove it from the interest point of the, the, the it's spectrum? It's no longer, currently it's not on the interest point you know, because there is no policy. So because of that, um, customs have to allow all the drones in. Okay. There's no policy. There's currently a policy being developed we were asked to comment on it at Spectrum, but it's with the Ministry of National Security, I think. Okay. Drones are, because drones are considered to be aeronautical devices or equipment, okay. it's so you're really the purview. Another way to limit it now, though. It's really the purview of the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority. So they really, what their scope, from what I understand, is they're supposed to money to what flies in the airspace. Yes, yeah, so drone operators, it is being proposed, should really get approval from them to operate. That, that's one other question though that, for example, I have to address or ask about in terms of short-term license and how we use devices such as drones. Mm -hmm. Because um, for, for, for us as an industry, it's rather difficult um, every time a drone is supposed to be used, whether commercially or personally, that some form of permit has to be or license, because this has been in talk, in, in dialogue for like last year or two. Um, I remember coming to this last year and it was something that was brought up as well, in that the use of the drone and if I'm shooting a wedding or I'm shooting an event, to be able to apply for a license every time rather than getting an approval status for a specific unit or a company getting a license creates an issue. Nowadays though, a lot of the drones that we have, especially for commercial people mm -hmm. or businesses, what we use are GPS enabled. So I know you have your dead zones in terms of mm -hmm. your airports, your flying zones, stuff like that. But outside of that, don't you think it's a little bit, it's, it stifles business? when limitations are like that every time I have to be okay I'm going to be using the drone tomorrow at between 12 and 2 in this circle right here 
right at every time I have to apply for that that's a wonderful question that was even being addressed prior to me speaking because we were having a similar discussion with Mr. Allen a um, couple of minutes ago where forums like this and this is one of the reasons Jampro is putting together the commission because what my understanding is and which is welcome because other industries do this MAJ does a similar thing we don't deal directly with ships commercial ships or per personal ships all ships yachts boats are done through MAJ so they so in other words they'll decide and look at you, your need whatever your what's most efficient to you and arrange to get that permit done or licenses done that so they deal with us we give them a license depending on your need and then that satisfies that so in this instance Jampro will now be your broker where when you come to Jampro and tell Jampro what you want to do and I guess this will inform this discussions like this should be able to inform some of the policy as I was telling Mr. Allen because the policy is currently being developed it is in draft stage to speak to stakeholders like yourselves because as much as we want to manage how the drones are used um, my understanding is that they're trying to restrict the height that the drones can go to but that is so standard almost in every drone basically nowadays right but as i say again there's no policy and because there's no policy each individual agency or person may take it upon themselves to want to say oh i'm concerned about this and then put restrictions on you that really are unnecessary and that's what was happening Customs say x um, civil aviation authority say x for us at sma we recognize that our concern about the drones was already been um, addressed by the international telecommunications standard which is the manufacturers have to abide by so once they're abiding by those standards and the person said the manufacturer they send it, the request for type approval to us and it's type approved really have no reason to no interest for us oh by the way sorry pairings with <laughs> crystal clear productions um so almost no um spectrum has taken over themselves and all of this now has to do with C cva yeah. with the exception that if we see if maybe there's a drone that is too large because what tends to happen at customs this is being streamed right Yes. yes, what tends to happen at customs is that they look at the cost of a drone and then decide that they want our input on it. Oh, so rather than look at the toy drone and if, if it's yeah. 5,000 US, uh, yeah, possibly it's a little bit better than our <laughs> stronger. Yeah, but it's not the way to go. They really should be looking at the specifications, as you rightly say, if it's speaking to a particular megahertz operating gigahertz and say it's here or there. If it's outside of that, then you might want our input on it. And usually, there is a database that they refer to, so they can put a model of the equipment in here to see if we have already type approved it or not. Okay. All right. Good. I won't distract you any further. Thank you. <laughs> not a distraction. <laughs> it's welcome. Um, that's about it for me. Thank you in terms of my presentation. If there are any other questions or discussions that we'd like to have more than what we have been doing, I welcome them. If nobody else has a question, I, forgive me, I'm an engineer by profession, by training, sorry, but I own my business. <laughs> All right, um, coming back to your frequencies now, um, I understand that you have the Spectrum, Spectrum Authority has uh, reallocated some of the frequencies, primarily in the 600 megahertz. Hmm. Um, I don't, I think, I believe Ready TV is on now, has bought all that digital spectrum now, and there's a great move internationally i think for the 600 megahertz for digital tv um, what could have been done because from a production standpoint when i invest in equipment that was previously allotted at 600 band for example wireless microphones um, what could have been done to facilitate a changeover because i've made a, I've, a, um, i don't know if the consideration was taken for those who would have possibly invested some funds, to me it might be small, you know, in relation to the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that a, a TV station might in invest. But there are pieces of equipment that one lie within that 600 band that no, we are at a disadvantage of all production companies too. That's one thing. Um, so if you guys could address that, 
and I think there was one other thing, but when I remember it, um, I'm not sure what. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to get into the technical era, which I don't understand. Not to say that I don't understand, I might not be fully cognizant. But my understanding is that some of those equipment can be can't be reassigned. So we could reassign a different band. So even within that six hundred band, there are different levels that we could put different people at. So we may be in the six hundred band, yes, we have given ready T V or whomever a particular range, but then there are other ranges that are left for other equipment or other users. Okay. Yeah, the walkie talk is why would you, you talk about two-way radios. Um, uh -huh. If you look on it realistically, you can go on Amazon and get um, a two-way radio for $30, but yet still um, you need a license for something in the 430 megahertz to something which is a standard walkie-talkie band, or is it not? The FRS band or something like that? Uh, um, primarily what? Is Opal Power or what is the problem? The issue is that uh, it, it, it can cause interference. Outside of a particular range, it is causing interference and can cause interference. So that is where the the, 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 the issue for the license comes in. It's probably driven though by the, the act. Primarily. So, I mean, with with what we're seeing, advances in technology and what is becoming the standard internationally, which we adopt regionally and locally, the next time when the act comes up, when we tend to look at things and submit them for amendments to the act. Because it's something that we recently did last, last fiscal year, or year before that, I think it might have been before, where we made some amendments to the act to facilitate this, the CB operators because what was being required was for them to have some training or examination in terms of Morse code. Mm. And yeah. <laughs> it wasn't a requirement to use it. We found that that was ridiculous. Yeah, this was ridi really ridiculous. Good, so good. Uh, I'm glad you agreed. So Sorry. as more of, as ridiculous. I said, more of these come to the fore, I mean, I will take what you're saying back to the engineers and we put it to our policy team so they can put it to the minister for consideration to amendment to that act. And similar, because as I said to you, as, we, as you rightly say, more and more things are becoming the standard and the, we are guided by the regulations and operate on the regulations of the IT, ITO. That's okay, man. All right, me should, again. Should I tell I, him that you were my I, tutor? Eh? Did I, should I tell him that you're my tutor? My tutor? Yeah, you uh, taught me. No, I didn't teach you. Oh, no, you didn't? No. You're part of the team. We used, I think he used to play volleyball at Bethany. No. No? You, we did a, more we more did a sound, and per, sound and video oh, yes, yes, course. Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 uh, yes, 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 yes. And you are the younger one, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Blessings to you. All right. Um, the... This is up for consideration as well. And part of this is just experience um, in terms of bringing in stuff. Yeah. For production, you'd be surprised the smaller things that add to your, your cadre of equipment that you need on a set or on a production. And, and why I've been able to bring up certain issues of this, like um, for radios or drones or your cameras um, or your wireless transmission devices, because you, you're sending your camera wirelessly or in a case you need a bi-directional link from office to an, a site you ask these questions because every, every day you can talk about it now you can pop up a ubiquity antenna right um, and all of them running on the 5.8 gigahertz or the 2.4 yeah. right um, i know the 12 gigahertz is is restricted access stuff like that on the 24 gigahertz but you find that if you come in for a license i i will be honest I bought radios overseas about three years ago, spent $99 on a pair of six. I had to 
it accidentally got shipped to Miami when it was supposed to be shipped to Jamaica. So I freight forwarded it to here. Cost me 100 US, 120 US, more than the cost of it. I got to, I paid that money, so I think of it, paid 30,000 already. I get to the airport, they detain it, I come to Spectrum, and the requirements to get a permit for a small business, it was cheaper for me to call that $30,000 a waste rather than what I had to go through. Why is it so difficult? They needed a um, letter of good standing. They need um, where your business is. Oh, of course, you don't want to know where you are, look, are, but uh, it, it is not for a commercial purpose. And I think that for individual companies that are not running like, a, for example, a taxi service or something, which using a broadband repeater section, there needs to be, a, I think there needs to be a revision one on the costing of these licenses because it was something like almost thirty thousand dollars for the license right um we had to re be renewed annually right um and then in addition to that these are some of the things i wonder why is it that people if you don't make a process um the ease of getting a process done people will always find ways to get around it and this is what you know, introduces some of the problems that you're facing I'm going to address some of it. I think you might have been guided incorrectly because there might be there are a host of licenses. You just need to choose the one that is more. I talk about that same 400 to you. Mega band um, walkie talkie radio, and every time it says five watts. Because of the power. No, five watts. Right. Um, that being said, some of the restrictions are most of them, or requirements, they call them restrictions, one and the same are driven by the international regulations. So if we want to abide by those, and if we say we are abiding by it and a member of the union, we have to do those things. So it's kind of like out of our hands. There's some things that is out of So if somebody, if you come for a CB, if you're a citizen band and you want a CB radio permit, there are certain requirements that you have to satisfy. The challenge when we find we, we find that there are these challenges for the persons or most of the users and stakeholders in that industry we tend to speak to the person or the body that is responsible for them and then try and get that body to set up some mechanism that will mitigate some of those restrictions jambro you are our body as right. production people <laughs> thank you madam field commissioner <laughs> <laughs> to my film commissioner. <laughs> but, but you are right, that, that's what happens. Because with the amateur radio op operators, we're having some challenges similar to what you're speaking of. We spoke, they have an association. So we spoke to the association. The association works with us to inform, educate, and help us to do some of the things easier for them, but helps in the end satisfy the requirements that would ensure that they get what is required of them and um we're currently moving to some of the more <laughs> more efficient ways and means of satisfying the users all right thank you any other questions hmm? that being it i thank you for being a good audience i do welcome the conversations um I wouldn't employ you to have more of them, especially in this forum, so that the information can come to us through Jampor, or you can ask the questions via the email address and the website. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. So we will now move on to the next segment, which speaks to filming on location. Unfortunately, one of our panelists is running late, but we will still proceed. I'm going to ask Tristan Elaine, our next moderator, to introduce the speaker who is presently here. Thank you, Tiffany. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks for staying after lunch. Um, as you know, or as you would have learned in the panels and the discussions that came before, 
different locations carry with them different requirements, different permits, licenses, um, and it's really important that you know and you understand how this works so that when you're planning your production, when you're executing your production, it's a streamlined process, there are no issues, and you know how to work with the, with the bodies that are responsible for that location. One of those bodies is the Mobe Airport. And we have, land, um, we have Mr. Audley Giles here um, to have an open discussion about his role um, at this authority and entertain your questions. Uh, so please come up, Mr. Audley Giles. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. Um, a big thank you to Jampro, the Film Commission, and Commissioner Robinson for inviting MPJ Airports Limited to this evening's session. Um, before I delve into um, our role as a facilitator, as a site facilitator, I, I'd like to just, just emphasize the importance of what the Film Commission is doing. Uh, based on my limited interaction with the film, in film industry from an airport operator standpoint, and I look at it from two, perspective, two perspectives. One, the impact and the potential impact that it has or it can have on the wider economy. Uh, Jamaica, in all its talk relative to economic growth, we have to look at how we diversify our economy. And I think that the multi-billion dollar film industry is one way that we can certainly pursue that growth with all its appendages and the, its tentacles and its offshoots for potential revenue generation. <coughs> and certainly then, it, as it relates to augmenting processes and systems and as a site facilitator how we can then streamline our processes on site and align it with what the film commission is 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 doing and has been doing for some time um, so at MBJ airports limited Sangster international airport in montego bay um, we saw the need some time ago to streamline how it is that we dealt with um, requests for filming on site. And we have developed a relationship, a positive relationship, with the Jampro over the years. Um, because one of the first things that you, when you call my office, one of the first things that we'll ask is whether or not you have approval from Jampro. That's the most fundamental thing. Um, in addition to that, we have our own application process where you have to, as a, as a potential um, as a production crew, you have to prov uh, complete an application form, which is a, a quite a simple form, where you provide us with information detailing equipment that you'll be taking in, the power requirements. Um, of course, for security purposes, we'd need to have um, identification information for all the persons who will be on site. One of the things that we would have also recognized with the um, requests for filming at the airport, we realized that it's, it's really one of those opportunities that you will always have that will provi provide free advertising for the country. Um, so we have tried to limit the, the costs associated with filming at the airport. On average, and we've had some really large productions at the air, uh, at Sangster International, Big Fat Loser, you name it, a number of these international productions. Um, on average, I'd say if you go through the application form, if you're shooting for a one day at the airport, depending on the size of the, the crew that you're taking there, 
it would not and should not, as far as the fees that we, we charge, it should not cost you more than $200, $300 US um, in total. That there isn't a site fee that's charged. The, 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 the fees that are charged are all based on the need to you know, replenish security passes. So we need to charge for the security passes that are provided. A security escort, because if you're going to, regardless of where in the airport, and of course, you're now in a, uh, your, your, your request to film at an airport is going to be completely different from a request to film anywhere else on the island because of the onerous re security restrictions that are in place and based on the nature of our operation. Um, especially if you're going to request filming airside, that's post security. So we try as best as possible to facilitate, I can't recall ever um, denying a request for filming. It's a very straightforward process. I think one of the things that are coming out of or our discussions, we would have shared some of the challenges that we would have had. Uh, and one of the things definitely from a local standpoint, because I know that international um, production companies, they normally hire uh, a local site manager, if you will. And there oftentimes was seemingly some sort of disconnect between the international company, the, the person who was managing the, 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 the production locally, and the site itself and the requirements that we have. So I know that this process is part of the tightening of those, uh, the framework within which um, filming uh, is done locally. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Giles. Um, Mr. Fisher, you want to give us some insight into your role at the UDC and the ways in which the UDC intersects with, the, with filming in Jamaica? Please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, opportunity to be sharing this afternoon. I'd like to endorse the statements made earlier. We at UDC are happy to be partnering with the Film Commission as well because it does provide opportunity to be able to streamline things so that we can have a standards and a, a shared standard across the board. Um, because one of the things we've realized even within the UDC group of companies is that there are requests for access for filming have been treated in different ways because the requests are at different standards, you know? So having the opportunity to be able to streamline is a, a great opportunity and one that we are very happy for. Uh, so at UDC, we operate through a number of different companies, a group of companies. So the Urban Development Corporation, our head office is downtown on the waterfront. But we also have a subsidiary company, the Saint Anne Development Company, SADCO. And that entity manages quite a significant portfolio in terms of properties as well and, and the value, uh, value of those properties. So. We have uh, a number of, number of different ways in which we operate, or entities through which we operate. Now, we have, through those entities, received various requests from time to time for filming, and for various reasons, uh, or you know, for various yeah, reasons, uh, whether it is for advertisements or for meaning a, a product advertisement, advertisement or uh, a marketing campaign. So a product advertisement is done locally, a marketing campaign for uh, tourism purposes that's shared internationally, or for major film productions, you know, um, blockbuster movies, that kind of thing. We also receive uh, far more frequently, I think, uh, requests for filming for um, up and coming music artists, you know, so that is something that is very, very frequent and pretty much every two weeks there's somebody else who comes in. Now what we have been deliberate about doing is recognizing that this is an opportunity not only for the persons who want to use the facility for filming but also for the UDC. So we do have as well a system in place which does require that some information is provided. So essentially what all that we're aiming to do is to ensure that we have sufficient information from the persons who have approached us to use our facilities so that we are clear that the 
activity that is being undertaken, the effort. <laughs> so that we are clear that the activity being undertaken and the purpose for which the product and the production will be used is something that is, of course, on the up and up, and certainly um, that the use of the facility during that time is not antisocial. So we ask for basic information. We also have a form that we ask for you to fill out. We want to know who you are. Um, uh, the, for instance, the number of persons that will be coming on site, uh, how long you intend to stay on site. Like, again, basic information so that we can manage the process as well. Um, because some filming will take place while our properties are open and being used. So we don't manage airports, of course, but we manage, for instance, uh, Sidco, the Saint and Development Company, manages Duns River, right? Um, hugely popular, and Duns River doesn't close. Even Christmas Day, Duns River don't close. And that's because of the sheer numbers that flow through those gates every day. So when you have an idea of uh, what it is you intend to do on site, how many persons you bring on site in terms of your crew, um, the cast as well, they were able to manage the process so that the film was uh, benefit, we benefit as well. In addition to that, um, recognizing that in, m in most instances, when it is at local film producers approach us, they don't necessarily come with significant financial resources behind you and recognize that. Um, so our fees for the most part, for the most part, well, our fees are all very manageable. Um, but some fees are more manageable than some, right? All right, so for instance, um, for the majority of the properties managed by, uh, on my portfolio, so I should say I'm, I'm director of sales, and so I manage a portfolio of properties stretching from downtown Kingston into St. Catherine. So on, in downtown Kingston, we have all the waterfront, essentially. Um, so car parks, uh, whether it is a surface car park or a multi-story car park, um, if you want to film something just with a kind of elevation looking over the Kingston Harbour, or if it is that you need to film a, a speed chase going through the multi-story garage, a bit of marketing. Um, so that, that kind of facility, and it stretches also over into St. Catherine where Fort Clarence Beach is one of the facilities we have, and we go all the way over into Portland, Reach Falls, um, down to the western end of the island where we have more beaches in Montego Bay and Negril as well. So we rec recognize that when we are approached, persons don't necessarily come with a, a significant amount of financial resources and so our fees are kept at a very manageable um, point. I remember being approached by someone filming a production for a, tour, a cruise company late last year and he asked, for, he asked for the price, and I indicated I would send that quote, and he begged me not to, not to kill him. And when he sent the price, he, when he gave him the quotation, he looked at it and asked, is this it? Because it really is a very, very low price. So we don't, we don't reach the $20,000, depending on, again, how long you stay on the property. Um, <laughs> <laughs> depending on how long you stay. Um, everything is a, is a, it's a bit sweeter on the north coast and so the, the fees that you'll pay, say if you're to go to Dundra for instance, or to our Pearly Beach property, both of which are re really high end, well Pearly Beach is really high end and Dundra is in very great demand and the fees there are different, um, but for the majority of the properties they're kept at a f well within reach, well, well within reach, very. For the UDC, that second question, uh, because it, our rates are just flat, the flat rates. Um, we, unless there is some technical component to the the filming that's being done, um, turnaround time is normally within 24 hours. 
Right, so for us, turnaround time, assuming that you are able to provide us with enough information that satisfies us, um, then same day, we can literally walk in at 3 o'clock, uh, fill out the form, pay the money, and then walk onto the site that you're going to film on. Once it is that, um, again, you provide sufficient, sufficient information and uh, the operation on the facility will allow for the filming to take place at that time, so same day. Um, the rate, good. All right, so for us, the rates, so let me speak very clearly. Uh, downtown, right. Right. So let me take a step back then and, and just reiterate that, reiterate that our, our processes really are just to ensure that what is done is something that won't bring the company or the facility into disrepute. Cool. Um, so once we're satisfied with that on the front end, we can't tell what will happen eventually or ultimately, but, right? Um, and we do see every film production, large or small, uh, as an opportunity for us to benefit as well. So our facility is marketed. So, ultimately, long and short, um, apart, well, so we have two sets of rates, really. It's either a very, very low rate, or it's free. Um, and whether it is that we waive the fee will depend on the nature of the production. So there are some productions that are um, maybe a documentary or something that is definitely going to be seen as um, benefiting some charity or some charitable um, means. Then we are much more likely to be able to waive the fees in that, in that instance. Um, but it typically is either low rate or it's free. I mean, and just to follow up on your question, um, yeah, I, I probably get that call once every week um, where security would have spotted someone who is filming or taking pictures on site. And again, that's something there, <coughs> especially, I guess, with, with whether it's an enthusiast or it's just um, someone, a Jamaican, who is just proud of <laughs> heading through the airport and there shouldn't be an issue with me taking out my camera and taking pictures. Um, the airport is public space until you pass the roundabout at the airport. Um, the, the laws that govern the operation of the airport are international laws, are ICAO regulated and um, as far as security and general operations are concerned, um, though that will have an impact with respect to how we treat individuals who wish to do filming. So it's not a situation where you can come on property and just pop out a camera or a, a camcorder and start filming because there are implications. Can I say that one of the things that we, we is one of the realities that we, we do have to use our discretion. So there are instances when you can look at somebody filming, either taking still or, or um, motion shots, and you can, in your heart, you feel, or you know, even people alone, it's a man and a friend. Um, there are other instances in which it is clear, you know, that this is something that, uh, whether it reaches there or not, it has as its intent some commercial endeavor. Part of the process of streamlining the whole um, process of um, signing up to film is that, and we've spoken at length about this, is that once you are filming on one of these locations, you would like you you need to inform the bodies whether they're going to waive the fee, whether it's a small camera, whether it's a small group. They will need to be informed, otherwise it could be a headache, especially, you know, the airport, depending on what location it is. Um, so 
As Rene had discussed earlier about um, the Film Commission being a one-stop shop, the idea is that you would come to the Film Commission and then we would inform the relevant bodies about how best to go about applying for the permit to film, however small it is. Um, one question, what are the challenges that you face? Sometimes a crew may even get the, the permits, and once they're on location, what are some of the, the issues that you have when, once they're there, and can you kind of walk us through how to mitigate that, and what are your expectations once crews are on, on your locations? Please. Oddly, you can. Um, <clears throat> I think generally, I, th I mean, there is some amount of, especially, well, any, any production crew, whether international or local, um, there is some amount of personal responsibility, due, uh, due diligence that must be conducted with respect to, you know, you're going on site at X location, at the very basic information you must have what are the requirements to, to shoot on this particular side so we have seen um, quite a number of um, issues crop up where you have individuals who turn up at the airport to film um, without us knowing that they had any intention of it. It means that they would have in the past, they would have gotten approval from a, another government entity outside of JAMPRO and for some reason they took that okay, go ahead, to mean that you can just go on property and film. Um, we have had issues with um, site managers not being Okay, with the, the the requirements working within the space of the airport. So you come and you see a three buses parked in front of the terminal, and you go over and ask what's happening here. And oh, yeah, this is part of the filming. But yes, you did not put that on your application form. That and the application form specifically required you to state whether or not you're going to require parking close to the terminal and whether or not that's part of filming. Um, so there are those issues that I think are solvable because, again, having this conversation about you know what's required on UDC's properties, what's required at Sangster International. Airport, we have that conversation with you, the regulator of the industry. You then have this knowledge to then disseminate to someone who comes in to apply for a, a permit. So that conversation is, is, is ongoing and as our processes evolve and you know we try as best as possible to keep in touch with JAMPRO and allow them to be um, aware of whatever changes we have um, effected at the airport. I would say that our two main challenges are management of information and management of personnel. So managing information to ensure that the requirements and expectations are clearly communicated and understood before you actually go on site. Um, and so that you be clear that you know what conditions will apply once you get on site to start filming. I got to work one morning, um, drove into the car park, and half the staff that used the car park were unable to park because an entity had asked to film in the car park. They provided the terms, didn't read them clearly, and they assumed that they could do X when they really said Y. And so on a day when they would not have been allowed access, they were in the middle of the car park taking up half of it. And of course, when they, and they brought a, a, a cast, a whole bus load into a cast and technical team. So it, it is hard for them at that point in time to tell everybody, all right, go home, come back tomorrow. Right, so had they been clear on the instructions and the approvals before, would have prevented that. Managing people, um, when you get on site, so we project that you're going to speak, sorry, you're going to uh, be shooting from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and you indicate that clearly and then you get on site and you get on site at 9 o'clock or 9.30 or 10. Uh, and then you go on filming until 11 o'clock, 11.30, and it just runs. So it, it, the process isn't managed, the people aren't managed, and so the time gets away from us, right? And it impacts other things. It impacts uh, the arrangements that we would have made to facilitate the filming crew. 
and it impacts how it is that the rest of the properties are allowed to operate because again most of the facilities are the facilities that persons walk into to enjoy them you know sure go ahead I'm Angela Phillips, uh, Sunshot Film. One of the things I've seen quite often is persons using, whether it's the Emancipation Park, UDC, or wherever, as a backdrop for, and you see this mostly in music videos. When that becomes out in the public without getting the clearance and so on, how do you deal with it? Do you allow it to slide or there are repercussions? Okay, um, let me say first of all that I'm happy that we also have in the room Ms. Lorna Clark, who is our Director of Corporate Relations and Marketing. What we do in an instance like that is that we try to manage relationship with uh, the, that particular stakeholder. Um, so at that point in time, some things have gone beyond what we're able to correct or manage. Well, not manage, but to manage in a way that we would have wanted to, so it's no corrective and so we seek to make contact with that entity to one encourage um, that the use of those images again um, are it's done in a way that the corporation is pleased with or doesn't bring the corporation again into disrepute and we seek to manage a relationship with that person from there on so that it's continued use one if it is that we're able to have at least um, be given rights and to acknowledge this right um, and two to manage that any future filming is rooted through the correct channels that's what we seek to do um I th well just to respond again i guess i can't reiterate it enough um filming at the airport it's completely different with respect to the requirements than most other sites that you it's it has to be extremely scripted in terms of you know where you are at a particular time because that can have adverse some sort of adverse impact on or on our operation and we're dealing with a certain demographic so filming and i'll give you one one particular story uh, and this was on, it was an error on our part, actually. Um, we were producing a, some, a retail ad as the airport, and th we, we operate in a very litigious environment. Individuals who are accustomed to dropping a lawsuit at the drop of a hat, North Americans. And we captured someone in one of our, um, in, one, in, one, in one scene, and her face was dead set on camera. And she wrote to us because she w we would have uploaded this on our website, on social media. She wrote to us and said, "You need to get this down and edit that, or edit my my face out because I did not give permission." Um, so w with us in that environment, we have to be extremely careful. Brands, um, you know, and that's one of the things that we emphasize when you have a production crew coming in. If you intend to capture, let, let, put aside our, our logo and our brand Sangster International, but if you're going to capture a third party logo, the name of an entity in your, you need to get pre-approval from that entity. Uh, uh, my question is somewhat aligned to that, um, and thank you for touching on it. Uh, how, two questions, really. How do you deal with if MBJ, in the sense, is stops at the, the roundabout or starts at the roundabout? Um, what's the legal right for production teams, um, for example, a news broadcast shooting on property without um, just popping up and getting shots, whatever? Somebody's coming in um, and they want to, some dignitary they want a shot. What is the policy for that? Can security tell them no? Right, that's one. And two, in the case where specifically you had that issue with that lady, um, how can it be dealt with? Can you, for example, I've seen, I've been at the airport and I think they were shooting something with bolts there. Mm -hmm. And I saw them put up a little board that said, you know, walking in this, in layman says, walking in this area, you give permission to, or you may be caught on film if walking in this area and you give permission for that access. Right, um, without normally the usual signing of document, talent release, or stuff like that. 
Have you found things like that to be an issue in spaces like that, primarily the airport? Um, no, you know, that was an anomaly, <laughs> that particular. Do you know what I'm talking about? They were shooting right outside of the exit um, of, um, not the, 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 right where you leave um, immigration, not immigration, is it immigration mm -hmm. or baggage hall? Um, I, I'm not familiar with that particular about two situation. Years ago. But there was a, a film crew out there. Mm -hmm. But what they did is that they tried to they put up on some stakes or like a banner board, and it, all it said really was mm -hmm. um, We are filming in this area. Um, if you walk in here, you may be caught. Right? Um, and as a means of it, is that you now basically give up your rights because we'd have given you notice of there because there are other ways to walk. Fine. That, that's in layman's terms, mm -hmm. I say what mm -hmm. was happening. Yeah, yeah. But you know, them formalize it really. Um, but that's one. And then you can go back to the other issue. Um, I, I, I can't say that that's sufficient to safeguard someone coming back to you and say, hey, I, you've captured me in a scene in your ad or whatever, and I need you to edit it out. But, However, but, but how, are you going to what, clear out the entire baggage hall when you need a shot and, in the and day? That, and, that, and that is why, and I'm, not, I'm honestly not familiar with that request. It must have been a day when I wasn't at work, because all requests come through my desk. Um, it's not, again, not recent, you know, it's nothing recent. Um, I literally, it's two, three years, I but because I'm production oriented, yes. I noticed it. I guess, I, I, and again, whatever filming is done at the airport that I've overseen, it's extremely scripted. Time of day, because we know our peaks when we have passengers coming in in droves during, and we steer clear of those periods. We, we I'm, I'm oftentimes, even though we have security personnel on site, I'm also there to say, hey, you're getting a wide shot and you're capturing X, Y, Z you need to a not film that or if you have filmed it and you want that particular scene you're gonna have to do something to 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 blur um the, the, that per, those individuals faces out of that particular scene so I, i'm 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 that's not sufficient um a, a safeguard against someone coming back to you and say no problem what about the television stations uh, or any <coughs> anybody who is willing to get a news clip mm -hmm. of Oh, so I might be an independent producer, but I feed news to a station, or I am following a story based on a documentary, right. and the minister comes in, or Alia Atkinson wins her gold and is coming right. home, and I want to shoot her for my posterity, right? I am archiving footage. Um, what is the, 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 the airport stance on media um, generally? outside without going inside of either your check-in areas your baggage hall or anywhere what's your stance on it we have a, a, a far more liberal relationship with the media um and it, it's a positive relationship we've been able to develop with the media in the sense that if um any of the guys from any other western um bureau whether it's observer gleaner where whoever it's coming on site, they have my cell number, they have my manager's cell number, they'll pick up the phone and call and say, hey, we're going to be coming in to, to film, and it's normally a yes. So there isn't that arduous task of, oh, you need to complete a form, no, 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 because we understand the nature of, of news, so the relationship is far more flexible, and it's not for commercial purposes, so the relationship is far more flexible with the media. All right, I'll speak to you for that number after. Just, it's good to have one as a backup. <laughs> Thanks. Do we have any other questions? problems sometimes are a disconnect between those the the international party um, his laser on the ground uh, who is supposed to help with the logistics and and the institution or the organization that has to get permission and then after that you there seem to have been a series of communication issues that seem to be challenges for both of you is it that the, the liaison people that we have on the ground, the, the professionals who are liaison or who are managed locations, 
Is it a lack of professionalism on, or lack of experience on their part? Is it, uh, what is the problem? Basically, I'm assuming you're dealing with experienced people who are your, um, who are the, the, uh, the location managers on the ground who are working with the international organizations. Well, I haven't in my time yet seen um, that disconnect between the overseas entity and their local representatives here. What we have, what we have had is just the, as I mentioned, the disconnect between the local film production team or crew and ourselves. And um, I really can't say, well, one is that some, many, many, many of these persons really are relatively new to film production and new to the fact that there are certain requirements in certain spaces. So pre people assume that no rules apply in certain instances and so they will take certain steps, take certain action and then they have to be educated. Um, so that is for a part of it, the fact that they assume that no rules apply and we have to inform them. In addition to that, uh, I honestly don't know whether it is, it is that things get lost in the mix because uh, sometimes these things seem to be rushed. You know, that is how it appears to us because uh, we are approached and the request is made but they are not necessarily able to provide the information you would expect that it have at that point in time. And so yeah, it, begs the qu it begs the question whether it is that this is fully thought through um, so that by that time you should be able to answer one, two, three, A, B, C. Um, that's a difficult question to answer because again, uh, you have to be interacting on an ongoing basis with the professionals that are part of the industry in order to determine what the core problem is. I think um, a part of the pro problem, I, I believe that we have to take our level of professionalism up a couple notches um, because I would have had points of comparison. Uh, we had last year, was it the year before, a crew from Germany, um, they're doing a reality, they're filming a reality show here and the site manager that they sent, she was meticulous to the T. Um, okay, we need to film on this style. Let's mark an X on this style. She was extremely meticulous. I've had, on the other hand, um, site managers, local site managers, um, where I've had to corral the, the team f for them because they were nowhere to be found at the point where a flight is landing and the, 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 the actors on, uh, who are supposed to be part of the, fil <laughs> the, the particular film, they're coming on this flight and the site manager is nowhere to be found. And, uh, and now I become the proxy site manager. I'm running around like a chicken without a head. So part of it is the level of professionalism that we take to, to, to our, our craft. And yes, then there's a part, the, the aspect of communication relative to, you know, uh, if I send you, a, I don't think that a three, four page document is, is too much for you to go through and, 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 and look at the finer details with respect to what's re required. And we have found out that that's the case. You know, there's a reason that I would have, s on the application form, it says for security passes, you need to provide me with XYZ names and then you turn up with 10 additional persons <laughs> that <laughs> were not on your application form. So there, it's, it's, there is some work to do. And again, it, this process um, that the Film Commission has started is absolutely critical to getting the industry into that mode to understand that in order to tap into this multi-billion dollar industry, just like every other sector, you're now competing not against the guy from down Barbados or wherever, you're now on a global scale. So that when Jampo puts in its, its guide so on that we have 10, 10 site managers of top standard and so on, there's some training that's needed before them can put that in. Yeah. All right, any more questions? Thank you, Oddly, Lance. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave the group, the group with before we... 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I, I must say that um, we really do look forward to interacting with the film industry um, much more frequently. And we look forward to uh, raising the standards when it's that again, we're all operating at the same level. And so we know that when somebody walks through the door, we know who we're dealing with. We know what the expectations are on, on both sides. Thank you. I mean, just to be end with um, the point that I started out with, um, we're looking at the whole notion of economic growth in this country. And in order to do that, we must diversify our economy, the sectors um, that we rely on. And the fact of the matter is we have not done a good job at, you know, insulating our economy from global shocks. You know, the tourism is a volatile um, industry. And I think that film, the film industry will provide and can provide that boost to the, to the economy that we have been searching for as a sector and it's sh the provision that, you know, the, the, what it contributes as it, as it relates to dollar retention, as it relates to providing the, the necessary uh, marketing for other sectors like tourism, you know, the, the, the upskilling that can take place because you now we have this framework in place which says that you're now mandated to have X, Y, Z. Um, so it, this is an, uh, we are at an intersection and we need to now grasp this opportunity with both hands and just run with it. Yeah. And just to add to that, what we're doing on the Film Commission side and ministries, departments, agencies, um, private sector bodies that are involved in this, in managing locations, permits, what we're doing to streamline these processes it's important, and it's important that you understand that, but as Adley was discussing earlier, your, the, the professionalism coming from the practitioner side is equally important, that when you apply to, to film in these areas, that you are very specific about where it is that you're going to film, about the time that's going to be spent there, the crew, the resources required, all of that is crucial to raising the level of the industry. Um, and I think forums like this are important. It's important to continue conversations with these point persons and they're very much available to speak to way in advance of your productions. Um, and I think the more that we have these kinds of discussions, the better. So thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Good news. The segment has not quite ended. We're going to hear from the Norman Manley International Airport as well. I ask them to now come up and do their presentation. Some introductions, my apologies. This is Yvonne Sweeney, and we also have Nicholas Amor. Good evening again, everyone. Good, well, good afternoon, sorry. Mm -hmm. right, so, uh, we're from the Norman Manning International Airport, Airport Authority of Jamaica, and to do a presentation on filming on location. Now, before we, before we go for a video.
uh, getting in this zone. All right, so while we while we get the the um, video sorted out, Mrs. Sweeney is going to give us a little bit about the Airports Authority of Jamaica. Okay, um, the Airport Authority of Jamaica is the Just to make your job a little easier, here is my passport. Cause I travel regular, very regular. The way them a security are professional and thorough in them searching. I wonder if they can find me long lost relatives. <laughs> Sweet lady, what is the exchange rate? You look like a nice and caring person. You can lend me a hundred US dollar. A nice thing. <laughs> oh, hi, sweet young lady, young lady. Me can get a back ready, icky me now, see? Mm, this is the life. As an international businessman, I travel so frequently, very frequently. As the kids will say, I love to go way up and stay up. <laughs> Jamaica, me soon come. Let me turn on the phone and make answer. But wait, now my man the international airport has free Wi-Fi. But they're not sure. They are going with things. And you come, you're going to go on Facebook. All right, so that was a presentation that we that we um, we did for our our nomination for the, the World Tra World Travel Awards 2016, and it, it has been making the rounds on uh, social media. And we'll we'll discuss further. We'll discuss that presentation further. Now, Mrs. Sweeney will give an overview of well, a little about the Airports Authority of Jamaica. Okay, just, just to say that the Airports Authority of Jamaica owns the airports on the island, mainly the three international airports, um, Sangster International Airport, Norman Manley International Airport, and the Ian Fleming International Airport, Boscoville. Um, the Airports Authority also owns the air drones, um, the Nicol Air Drone, the Ken Jones Air Drone, and the tin spent This the Sangster International Airdrome is concessioned and is operated by MBJ Airports Limited. And the Norman Manley Airport is operated by NMIA um, through the AAJ. Um, I think that is pretty much it in terms of the 
Airport Authority of Jamaica. We are really here to discuss the Norman Manley International Airport and the process processes that are to be adhered to in terms of a request for filming at our airport at Norman Manley. I think you more or less have a good grasp of what happens at the airport from our former colleague who was on stage earlier. So I guess life is easy on us <laughs> as Nicholas will take you through the process of um, handing a request for such um, procedure at the airport. All right, so, so request approval process for filming at the airport. Now, we have three headings, as you can see there. So we have request ass assessment and approval. Now, that's a critical part of the, of the process. Um, contract signing and fee payment and coordination. Now, under request assessment and approval, and of course, all these, these headings are the stages within these, uh, under these headings are for the smooth execution of your project and the continuation of airport operation. Now, request and approval, request assessment and approval. Now, how are the requests to be submitted? Now, the, the, the mode of, um, sorry, the, the mode of, of Requests are that will that will accept. Now we'll accept written letters, written letters to the commercial department, well, the commercial development and planning um, department of the airport. And um, a request is received and is initially assessed based on the content and project scope. Now, as this, the, a decision to reject or further process the request can be made on the initial assessment and the airport is a family friendly organization and as such reserve the right to to protect its brand image against defamation from the aff affiliation of any brand product content etc so you won't namely if you have a project you know on let's say if you have a music video of people dying and drugs and all these things you won't namely get approval for such requests at the airport. Now, and based on the location, that is the level of security restriction or the sterility of the area and the scope of activity to be carried out, the, process may, the processing time may vary. All right, so the request should comprise of the following. A summary of the script. So, of course, that's, we don't know what a summary is. Um, the scope of activity slash project or concept or treatment, a uh, specific area being requested. And that is another critical thing, a critical um, area. So the specific area. Uh, the number and names of all personal vehicle, personal vehicle types and registration. Now this, this area is especially critical because we're gonna be having persons moving within the space, especially if they're going into a critical, into, into a sterile area. So if they're going through security, we must know who these persons are. We must know the type of vehicle. We must know um, the type of equipment that they're taking. We must know how many persons, so, so as to monitor these persons. Because it's not, uh, as, you may, as you may have heard from the, um, our colleague earlier, it's not a, the air filming at the airport is not, it's not as simple as going to a regular location. Uh, it's a very high risk, high security area. Um, of course, we mentioned equipment deployment and all permits, permits, licenses granted by regulatory body. Of course, Jampro is, a, is one of the regulatory bodies that you will get your film, your film license, your film license from. All right, so the assessment process. Now, a thorough analysis of the safety hazard and risk assessment, which includes traffic management, crowd control and security, accident pre prevention, and other risk factors must be carried out. And these are usually assessed based on standard, standard operating procedures, SOPs. Now, the Aviation Security Center Department, which is a department at the airport, the Operations Department, Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority, 
Jamaica Defense Force and IKO, International Civil Aviation Organization. We have regulations that that are that we have we are we are we are, we have to ensure that they are followed, and the these are these were enforced or these were enforced. We are the enforcers of these regulations that are issued from these re regulatory bodies. Now, another important area is the stakeholder analysis, and this must it must be assessed based on how the project may affect the airport stakeholders and shareholders. Now, the airport, as, an, as somebody who works at the airport, I, we get, I get a, the question a lot. Oh, you work at the airport, so that means you, you, you travel free or I can get a plane ticket. No, and the, the, my response would be, oh no, I don't actually work with an airline. You can't differentiate the, the two for many because you think that because you work at the airport, you automatically get traveling or, or you, you have your related to customs or immigration. But they're actually different different departments or different entities fall in, that falls under one umbrella. Now, and they all, fall, they all form the stakeholders for the airport. Now, the passengers, airport users, airport operations and aviation security department, the air traffic controllers, staff, airline flight crew, and the list is there. Now, after successfully meeting all the requirements with satisfactory and, you know, the approval process, the, it's time for the signing, the signing of a legal agreement which outlines a term and early rate of payment. Now, all right, so, a contract is prepared by NMIAL and uh, signed by both parties. So NMIAL and the film crew are, are known as the company in the contract signs the agreement and, uh, and this must be done prior to the day of filming. Now these are some key points within the contract and um, I'll just read them out real quick. Sorry, I didn't take my glasses with me today, so I have to get a bigger sheet. <laughs> All right, so the company agrees to use, so the company, that is the film crew or the requesting body, agrees to use reasonable care to prevent damage to the designated premises and it shall leave same in as good a condition as when it was received. Reasonable wear and tear from uses, from uses permitted herein expected. Any damage occasioned to the designated premises are arising out of the video shoot shall be rectified at the sole cost and expenses, expense of the company. Any security that is provided by the airport operator, that is us, so we're deemed the airport operator in the contract, is for the airport as a whole. Accordingly, the airport operator shall not be responsible for security of the video shoot. The company shall itself supervise and secure the video shoot. So the company, which is you. All right, the company agrees to execute the video shoot without impeding the flow of traffic or causing undue disturbance or disrupting the business operation of the airport, of the, the airport operator and other users of the designated premises. While the airport operator acknowledges the company, acknowledges that the company has the exclusive right to any videography made on the designated premises, the company agrees that such videography shall not be prejudicial to the image, interest, and reputation of the airport operator. So those are, those are some of the key, the key points that are outlined in the contract. And of course, as I said, it, the contract must be signed prior to the day of filming. So if, the, if filming is tomorrow, you can sign it today. Now, for the fee, the, the fee structure, there's, there's a standard hourly fee of hourly fee of 500 US dollars, and this can be paid before or on the day of filming, prior to the commencement of any requested activity. And the accepted the accepted modes of mode of payment are cash, credit, debit, and manager's check. 
and payment can be done at the security post. It can be beneficial um, to you in other ways. Remember, you know, that the commercialization of it, mm -hmm. the airport will be benefit. Not that you necessarily need it, but I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. But um, you have to take also into consideration in terms of the fees, you know, how it is that we operate. If you have a better understanding, you will know that that fee definitely needs to be relaxed really needs to be relaxed right it has a so That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. All right. So, and of course, of course, the um, so the 500 US dollars covers uh, covers parking, um, the security that we would dispatch for you. All right. Of course, you would you would have your own security, but we're going to be dispatching security who will be working on our behalf. <laughs> and and of course, yes. So parking and the security and access to the area. All right, um, so on the... I, I, I thought... Okay. 
totally understand it. I should know better, but better. I'm sorry, guys. Um, yes, as I said, the consideration could be there for a half day rate or a daily rate. And the daily rate might be a little bit cheaper than just going half day because you'd have already had to outset certain passes, parking, stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's just there for your consideration in terms of how, um, how NMIAL facilitates also because it's also branding you know you see when when people now move to the point that boy them charging me so much you know what they don't look for or, or what they make sure it doesn't happen they make sure that nothing of NMIA gets promoted and you, you you need to look at the mutual benefits of saying all right cool I want a shot of the building the the, 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 the beautiful gallery that you have there as you come around the roundabout what somebody will say now is all right cool I don't want not a sign for NMIA to be in there, right? Because the, you're holding it so fast to it that I have to monetize it to make it back that you shouldn't benefit. And it needs to be mutually beneficial to everybody, all right? And that is why I think this, this forum is so important because we get, we, we the airport operator and you the company, um, we get to flesh out these these topics and have a, an idea of what is happening in our in our country because we don't want we don't want you to we don't want to stifle the industry all right um we are the kingston airport and we and we want to ensure that you know we're promoting kingston and good and good quality to come out of kingston all right um because we have so many, so many local films, and when we when we see the quality of those films here, we want to ensure that they're they're going they're gone international. All right, so we're 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 very much we're very much open to to um to these forums and discussions. And uh, as Miss Sweeney said, Mrs. Sweeney said, we are going we're going to take it to you know the powers that be and uh, discuss further. Now we're on the last the last um, slide in our presentation. Um, it is the coordination. Now on the day of the, of the shoot, um, yeah. oh yeah. So on the day of the shoot, the film crew must report to the security, security post and make contact with the commercial department, commercial development and planning department. So that is the department that we're, that we're from. Or the operations department who will monitor, assist, and guide the process to ensure that the SOPs are being adhered to. Yes. Thank you. And now for the questions. <laughs> now for the further questions. <laughs> <laughs> But as I said, um, that is why this, these forums are important, you know, for us to really, to really get an idea of what is happening and where the pocket or the budget is. Now, earlier I had shown, I had shown the, um, the video with Oliver Samuels. Um, so we call that the Oliver departure experience. Now, that video was done by us and uh, of course we had to we had to get our own our own um we had to get our own pardon <laughs> no some of the fees were weird but yeah we had to get our own clearances because we're not we're not um we're not exempt from from some of the some of the from some of the pardon Thank you. We're not ex exempt from some of the requirements. Now we had we, for drone shots, we had to go through the JCAA. For for security clearances, um, for the pass for the film crew to go through with their equipment, we had to go through our own aviation um, aviation security department. For for filming in the in the security area, we so that general area that everybody goes through. 
we there's a that's a no no absolutely no no so not even i'm able to take pictures anywhere in the airport but not that area because that area is is deemed absolutely sterile so we had to find another area that is that is not so sterile so the general aviation area that has a that has a security screening point as well but with private flights it goes to and private well private persons on private flights mostly uses that area so we had to adjust in another video that well we haven't um, published it as yet we did the arrival experience now that one we had to that one was was a lot more tricky than this one because we had to get clearance from immigration because they have their own their own regulations that we had to adhere to we had to get um, approval from immigration we had to get approval from customs so that's two different entities that we had to go through um, and we had to keep go ahead this is like what Note that you've, you're listing all these requirements from the di various departments, mm -hmm. but in tr in terms of turnaround time through the um, airport authority, what is what would you say is the standard turnaround time for um, acquiring a location permit? All right. So usually for 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 any request for any request, whether internally or externally we would give it at least two weeks so two weeks in advance so especially for jcaa we would give them two weeks in advance at least two weeks in advance for okay. for their approval okay thank you so, so, so you as a as a you as a department um, once we apply to you you will go and do all of that necessary checks based on what we are requesting or we have to go to the individual departments well usually usually it would be encouraged to because it's really internal and when after assessing assessing the scope of activity right we will then reach out to these persons to advise them that through us because a lot of times we get requests through the through jam pro we did one recently and we had to go through through the you know so the, the, the it's a uh, once we only need to go to you and then you disseminate everything else down. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Okay. Thank you. But in in part. What in part. what's the? Because if it's if it's a case where you are acting on behalf, well. No, I'm not talking. I, for location access, don't worry about who the production company goes through to get to you. But once we get to. NMIA limited, mm -hmm. right? Do we now need to go, okay, we need to now go to civil aviation, do we need to go to here? The, is it that we just come to you? Because we are using your location, you know the restrictions that you have, that you now say, all right, cool, we will sort out all of these things for you on our behalf, or you're going to guide us to go to the places. Well, we as, well as we said in part, no, earlier on the, the required, the required, um, the required documents to submit with the um, with the request we had said that all all permits all permits and licensing um, for for the for the shoot to, to be done we don't really use shoot at the airport but okay um, all licensing and permit for the shoot to be done no no if it's if it's a case where um, where in any case, we still have to advise these departments because, especially if they are if they are going if they are affected areas. So, if you're going to be using the customs hall, right? If you had gone ahead and, and um, explained and to to write to customs to get clearance that you would like to use the customs hall, they would they from customs head office would have to send an, send in writing to to NMIA customs department. To say we're going to be granting granting permission for X company, that's what's like an X company, to to film in this area. When the request comes comes to us, we're going to be advising them or asking them if they you know 
if they had received this request or if they are okay with this request. You hear what you just said a while ago? Mm -hmm. A custom sent you the request, you know, and you go right back to them and no. say if they are aware of it. Well, I, th I think uh, Customs Head Office and, uh, and Customs NMIA should not be, the, if you come back to Customs NMIA, they still have to go to headquarters, so that should not, that's an uh, issue with Customs disseminating information, not necessarily, I think, some role that you have. But I, I don't know if you fully understand my question, in the sense that um, if I was going to UDC, right, um, or if I'm shooting out in the public space, or if I'm having an event, a permit for the event is needed but not the location or or if anything I'm approaching a location think of all of that back end done so Jampro has now said to me I want I want to film I come to Jampro and I have gotten everything and I'm looking at location mm -hmm. for my documentary and I say I want to go to NMIA NMIA is not I would never see NMIA responsible for getting my permit for um, having an event just per se, right? Everything NMIA deals with is what is within the auspices of maybe the roundabout to where the, the, um, the lighthouse is, come back round, this landing strip, all of that. When I come to that, I come to you, is that correct? Because I won't have necessarily, I can't have access to your 